until what happened was we got to the day when they gave us the final presentation at the MDL lab where they put all the technology out, they demonstrated it to us to the extent that it was working. Um, and suddenly um, there was this change of tune. They're like, oh yeah, well, you know, we decided that we're gonna put the Creative Commons licensing on there and that we're gonna like, you know, move forward with what you know you had sort of suggested at the beginning. And I was like, I, I was shocked of it. I said, so what what changed your mind? You know, and they're like, well, you know, it's just an educational project anyway, and like, you know. Creative Commons and open source, like you can never, you're never going to make money on open source. I mean, you know, it's just sort of this this fanciful idea. And I was like, well, there are plenty of people out there that are making money on open source projects. You just need to figure out a way to, to tweak it right, you know. And they were very unconvinced about the fact that open source could actually be a viable, you know, development process for engineers and for scientists and for educational use. And I said, you know, do you realize that that you know. Um, uh, What's his name? Uh, Joshua Itu is now, uh, who is the head of the Creative Commons, is now also the director of the MIT Media Labs. And the MIT Media Lab is like the flagship model for what all of these groups like the MDL Lab aspire to be. And so I said, you know, if like the flagship research group that tries to do research slash commercialization of various things in an educational setting has committed themselves to Creative Commons and open source to the extent that their new director is the director of open source, then this should be a lesson for everybody, right? And, but, you know, I, I sort of like bounced back up against this whole problem of, well, you know, whatever, it's just a one-shot deal, we're, 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 you know, we're not going to necessarily try and make money off of this thing. And then we get this email from Mark Steiner, who is the director of um, the MDL lab, as well as the director of all of the undergraduate engineering programs here on campus. And in there, he basically said, you know, for the sake of being able to let this research move forward, we have decided that we're going to grant the IP clauses that you asked for, but as an exception to the general policy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. In this regard, our general policy and stated objective with the Design Lab has been to identify sustainable funding sources for service-oriented projects that will facilitate our working with charitable causes in the future. And so essentially what, if you read between the lines, it's saying, Look, we just want to resolve this dispute. We'll give you the open source that you asked for, but this isn't going to be a viable project for us because we can't make money on it. And we had talked about the you know at the beginning of the entire process that maybe the MDL lab would allow us to continue working with them over future semesters and get a Rev two and maybe a Rev three and keep on moving like that. But now that they've sort of identified this as being like a non money opportunity, it seems as though their interests have essentially you know diminished or or are not existent at this point. So I just wanted to bring up, I went and did a lot of research on campus as to what the IP policy was in, in you know, various capacities. And if you go out to the Office of Technology Commercialization, they have lots of documentation as to how you're supposed to deal with intellectual property. And you can see they go through this sort of decision tree. And if they get to a point, so the, IT, the OTC evaluates the potential and commercial application of your design. Um, and if it's not patentable, which in this case, one of the things that we told them was, look, um, this is built on pre-existing open source technology. You can't take that and then put a copyright on it because their license says no copyright and you have to continue that agreement. Um, and so during this process they decided that it was not patentable. Um, they waive or, uh, or essentially say this is not something that we can copyright and then it just gets bumped up to essentially non-existent land. Um, as opposed to this model which is if it is patentable then it goes through this entire chain to figure out like where exactly the income comes from. I searched through every single document that has been produced by the OTC in like the last three or four years, and there isn't a single mention anywhere about open source, about Creative Commons, about GNU licensing, about anything like that. So that's just not even on their map. And that's a real problem for a large engineering school like this that is potentially putting off engineers to work in this field. So the current state of the technology is um, partly because we wanted to skirt some of these issues, but partly because a lot of the hardware that was designed by the team, the MDL team, was not working properly. We kept the MDL's architecture concept, um, but we ended up swapping in just a standard Arduino as opposed to the board that they had designed for us. Um, the interface device, which is this, so this does all the core sensing and that does the sort of you know control module to program it and get it set up in the field. Um, we maintain that part of the box, but the firmware at this point is maybe 50-50 between what the MDL designed and what we put into it. And then the current licensing as it stands is we apply the Creative Commons licensing as agreed with MDL and the engineering department. And then the GPU, GPL lesser license is applied to the firmware that was pre-existing in the code that we had taken from other libraries and we had to continue their licensing. So um, the lessons that we sort of learned from this are one, um, and this is certainly a lesson for Arcos, 
Rensselaer Center for Open Source, is uh, don't assume that just because your students are in, you know, involved and engaged in open source projects, that it's going to come to fruition and completion in the way that you expect it to be. Because at some point you may run into these walls of people saying that we don't necessarily agree with your patent evaluation. I feel like we got lucky, um, partly because we had, I had an advisor who knew enough people on campus to be able to push this up enough channels for us to be able to get the, the you know, sort of waiver on this entire thing. But I can't necessarily guarantee that would happen with a lot of projects, especially undergraduate projects where unfortunately I think that undergraduate projects are not valued for being viable research in a lot of cases. Um, I think that one way that this could happen is, to, is through educational processes. I was really shocked to find out that they really didn't know anything about the Creative Commons you know, market. I think it would also be viable for something like Arcos to have on the board. How many people are on the board of Arcos? Uh, we have around six or seven. Around six or seven. I think it would be a really fantastic opportunity for somebody from the OTC to come in and, and hear what the OTC has to say about these issues and why, and, or rather, what Arcos has to say about these issues. And even, for that matter, having somebody from OTC or even someone like Mark Steiner be like a guest member on the board. You know? right. in, in, in fact, uh, one of the students here, and I, uh, one of the students uh, had some difficulty with uh, Mark Steiner, so we, we changed the project spec to something else so that that person, that student can get along with uh, developing open source and so on. So because uh, whenever you go to the design lab and use, whenever you sign something, do not sign blindly. That is, when, whenever you sign any form, this is a rule of thumb. Read the form, what you are signing, what, what is it involved, and so on. And luckily, that everything for that student, everything has ended up well, and that student is doing uh, good work, and and that person is doing a good open source project this summer. And another thing that I, I realized on the other end of this is that we, as the sort of you know concept team knew we were very you know educated in terms of what an open source project is and how it should evolve um, but we really didn't anticipate the extent to which the people we were working with didn't know this and i think that if we were to do it differently we would have in that statement of work document had a page that explained explicitly the licensing that we intended to use how it differed from you know current copyright licensing in ways that they were perhaps familiar with it and had them sign off on that not only just the students, but everybody involved in the project. Mark Steiner, Mark Anderson, Janita Tanai, and make sure that everybody was in agreement with that before doing any sort of work. And I think it would have been a fundamental difference in being able to clear up all those, um, all those uh, misinterpretations at the very beginning. Um, and I, I, you know, like Arcos is an independently funded organization, um, which I think perhaps saves it from the, the scrutiny of a lot of educational bodies here on campus. But the yeah, it is more importantly the, the person who donated is a rich is an influential person so I anything I do I say that Sean O'Sullivan has done it. it he says it should be open source so don't question me anything that's <laughs> the response I was asked to do and that's the response I give it to him. and you know the thing that if you look further in the, into the OTC documents it says any, one of the, the things that makes you know, this sort of decision tree, one of the primary things that, that makes this decision tree is, um, what are there significant resources that belong to, or were, were funding lines, or equipment that was owned by the campus that was involved in developing this project? Um, and if the answer to that is yes, then they will immediately try and cover those expenses by putting a patent on it. So if you're using a laboratory that costs a lot of money to use, they need to recover those expenses and they're going to do it based on the research that you develop. So it's this really slippery slope. Um, the, the other thing that's very interesting is that I, I, I took this story to folks who were at Georgia Tech, um, folks who were at uh, uh, Carnegie Mellon, uh, folks who are at University of Toronto, people who I know that are working in similar circumstances. And um, they were all kind of like shocked by this, but then not quite shocked once they thought through what would happen on their own campus. And uh, I spoke to one group who actually got a Knight Foundation grant to do, it was like a half a million dollar Knight Foundation grant to do a, a, a participatory sort of citizen mapping project using GPS technology. And the Knight Foundation stipulates in all of its funding lines that everything that's developed has to be open source. And so if you end up getting a half a million dollar or more grant that's given to your campus, now by the way, anytime, if I, if I did a research project, if I applied for an NSF grant or whatever, and got that money, 
um, let's say I applied for a million bucks, 62% of that gets taken immediately right off the top by the campus for all of the overhead that's involved in doing that research on campus. So they immediately take 620 grand right off the top. It's standard figure. And so if RPI is benefiting from 62% of the money that comes in from the foundation that stipulates it has to be open source, that's a pretty strong call that the campus has to adhere to all of those rules. Otherwise, they could have that money taken away from them and they get into the lawsuit. And I think that, you know, while money like the NSF is drawing up day by day, um, there are other foundations out there that are willing to sponsor these kinds of projects, and I think that it's worth aiming for those kinds of foundations that are behind these calls. Um, and even the NSF, for example, has rules that they understand intellectual property and ownership, um, but they also have these rules about disclosure that any kind of, if you get public dollars that are coming from Congress to sponsor yeah, your it's research. Not from Congress, it's your money, your tax money yeah. that goes to the funding of all these things. So every citizen has a right to examine what the, if a pro pro proposal is funded, every citizen has a right to see what, what it is funded. And if he has any objection, he can send it to the congressman and so on. So it is the democracy at its work. So it's not, any, we are not advocating anything different. It's the, it is fundamental tenets of democracy. And you know, the thing that's really scary is that if you look at the way that the NSF has made agreements with um, universities since like the early 80s forward, which you can say is, you know, from the early 80s forward is when you end up having the entire trend of privatization, about the commercialization of universities. Um, you know, this, I mean, all major universities like this run more like a corporation than they ever did 20, 30 years ago. Um, it was much more about sort of research for, for research purposes, not so much for financial. Yeah. Uh, this is getting recorded, so some of these things you need not. That's fine. I have no problem making this. Okay. <laughs> um, you can come and get me if you want to. Thanks. The, uh, <laughs> okay, so okay, thanks. The candidate. Yeah, yeah. And so what I wanted to say is that, you know, because of this whole move towards sort of commercialist capitalist model in universities, um, the NSF has capitulated in a lot of cases to make more allowances for universities to make money off of the research that's being done with their dollars. And so what we would think of as being this, you know, this democratizing process about your money being going towards projects that then should be sort of free to the public um, has really changed significantly. Um, and it's uh, it's a pretty well known fact, um, and so yeah, that's my story. Um, if you guys have any questions, and by all means, let me know. And you know, I have to say that you know, I'm now that the sort of everything's kind of blown over. I want to go down and, and interview the various folks that have been you know involved with this thing because I think that they can have some really fantastic insights. And I really like everybody who was involved with the project. So certainly, no personal difference. It became almost a religious debate as to how to do research. And I think that it's. We are a university, and our job is to hash these things out. And I think that it was a really wonderful opportunity to bring those topics to the table. That's it.